Canadians are among the biggest energy users in the world. We burn fossil fuels to keep the lights on, to keep our buildings warm, and to power our vehicles. You could even say we're hydrocarbon hogs. BC produces large amounts of natural gas. Alberta's oil sands are the fastest growing source of greenhouse gases in the country. And Alberta burns lots of coal and gas for electricity. That also happens across the prairies, in Ontario and the Maritimes. And in every province, Canadians fire up their furnaces in the winter. But Canada's energy map is transforming. Wind, solar, geothermal and ocean energy are all ascending and together with Canada's abundance of hydroelectric power are poised to squeeze fossil fuels, possibly off the map. This is exciting. There is momentum around clean energy and I don't think it's going to stop. You know, clean energy is where the puck is going. Technology is leading the change and so are some key people. Marin Smith is the head of Clean Energy Canada. Her group is trying to accelerate Canada's transition away from fossil fuels. I mean, this used to be a boutique sector. Now it's big business. Last year, $265 billion was invested in clean energy. And the price of these technologies has been dropping year over year. The threat posed by a warming climate has changed the equation. We're already seeing the disastrous impacts. Climate scientists warn fossil fuels must stop warming the earth by 2050 to avoid even more catastrophic damage. I think people are really realizing that climate change has to be addressed and that renewable energy is one of the climate change solutions. Last year, investment in clean energy in Canada climbed 88% to $11 billion. It's now a race to see which clean technologies will dominate, and wind and solar are off to a strong start. Tim, it's a super windy day. Uh, is this good? Is this what you like to see? This is what we like to see. This is why we built here. And on a day like today, we're producing over 15% of Ontario's energy needs is coming from wind on a day like today. It's a proven technology, but as you pointed out, one of the issues that we are facing is... We're with Tim Smithman, an hour west of Hamilton, Ontario, at a wind and solar farm built by Samsung Renewables and its partners. On a less windy day, we used a drone to get up high and see how clean energy is already changing Canada's landscape. The 67 huge wind turbines here are an impressive sight, and so are the 450,000 solar panels that are spread out in the fields around this area. It's all part of the Korean industrial giant's $5 billion bet on Canada's renewable energy sector. Well, I'd say for solar, you're looking at 30-50% costs come down in the last five years alone. By manufacturing it here in Ontario too, transportation costs have gone down. So we're competing now with gas, we're competing with nuclear. In other words, renewable energy now makes economic sense. All of the big provinces now have plans for wind power to eventually take over electricity generation that's now run from coal or natural gas. One study from Stanford University projects by 2050, 58% of Canada's electricity could come from wind power and 13% from solar. Clean energy has passed the tipping point and it's gone mainstream. Well, I'm absolutely confident that our bets on low carbon technology will, will bear fruit. Among those in the investment sector driving the change is Tom Rand. He's a Canadian venture capitalist whose firm, Arcturn Ventures, has poured tens of millions of dollars into the clean energy race. So what really excites me about clean energy technologies is that for the first time, we're beginning to see technologies that in a, on an even playing field can compete head to head with fossil fuels. And we now have a technological pathway to running our economy that's a low carbon economy, which we couldn't have said 10 or 15 years ago. It's a 10 year process, right? For Rand, who agrees with the climate scientists, the big challenge is how to accelerate the use of renewables to avoid the most disastrous impacts of a warming climate. By the end of the century, fossil fuels will be done. They will be outcompeted by technology-based energy sources. 
But that doesn't solve the climate problem. We don't have 100 years. We have maybe 20. So the question is, how do you accelerate the adoption of these technologies? The big drawback for renewables has always been consistency. At night, solar doesn't produce power. Neither does wind on calm days. So you won't believe the solution that Curtis Van Welligem and his company Hydrostore have come up with to address that. And it's really just room temperature air we put deep underwater. He met us on the ferry at Toronto's waterfront to take us over to see his operation. There's a cool view of the CN Tower, but it's what's in the lake that's really neat. Nine meter tall balloons towed offshore, weighted down, and tethered 50 meters below on the bottom. The balloons act as batteries. Electricity from the grid generates compressed air, and that's held in the balloons by the pressure of the lake water. When power is needed, the air shoots back through this turbine and the power is returned to the grid. When you tell people about what you do with balloons underwater and electricity and compressed air, what kind of reaction do you get? <laughs> A lot of rolling eyes and saying, that's kind of neat. It was engineer Cam Lewis who dreamed up the idea. It's very novel. There's uh, some people worked on it around, uh, in the world, but we're the first in the world to actually build a plant and be running it. Hydrostore has a contract with Toronto Hydro to provide power during peak times. It's also signed the deal with Aruba to put its giant underwater balloons offshore of that Caribbean island. And without storage, there's a limit on how much renewables you can use. Uh, and if the future is 100% renewable, you need low-cost storage. Uh, this solution is dramatically, almost order of magnitude, lower cost than batteries. The storage challenge is at the heart of the clean energy race, and lots of people are jumping in with cool innovations, especially Tesla. In the U.S., the company's new battery factory in Nevada may revolutionize electricity storage in vehicles and homes. Tesla's plan is to market a $3,000 lithium-ion battery to store power from wind and solar. You can't talk about energy in Canada, though, without going to Alberta. The energy industry is the biggest culprit when it comes to CO2 emissions. Canada can end up with all kinds of solar panels and turbines, but unless this place changes, it won't make much of a difference. And when it comes to climate change, we know that if our industry is not a part of the solution, the solution will not include our industry. Lorraine Mitchellmore is the CEO of Shell Canada. She's also the company's executive vice president of heavy oil. The oil industry wants a spot in the clean energy race, and this is Shell's answer. The Quest carbon capture and storage facility in Fort Saskatchewan, north of Edmonton. But what it really excites me about this is this is the beginning of making our energy source that we have in Canada and in the oil sands, the beginning of making it very environmentally competitive. In the oil industry's equivalent of a ribbon cutting, Shell execs symbolically christen this facility by opening a big valve. In practice, when heavy bitumen from the oil sands is refined, it requires hydrogen, and the process of creating hydrogen produces a lot of CO2. Here, that gas is captured, liquefied, and pumped two kilometers underground, where it's hopefully sealed up forever. Shell says this carbon capture and storage plant, or CCS, will cut emissions by one-third, the equivalent of taking 250,000 cars off the road every year. But of course, it doesn't mean people are actually burning any less oil or having lower emissions, just that the process of creating the oil is slightly less harmful. But the execs who came to Shell's grand opening still seemed impressed. They experienced a new technology with virtual reality goggles Wait for it. and got their picture taken in front of a green screen, capturing carbon with a butterfly net. We expect over the next 50 years, energy demand will double. So it's still, it's slowing down, but it's still, well, uh, the fossil fuels will be a part of the mix in the future. And so we've got to deal with the next 50 years, if you like, uh, in, in reducing the carbon in the energy system. Another big knock on CCS technology is that it's very expensive. The Alberta and Canadian governments paid almost $900 million for this plant, an enormous subsidy. 
So, Tom Rand, the clean energy investor, doubts the oil industry's big bet will pay off. I wouldn't put a dime into carbon sequestration, and the reason is this. It just does not make intuitive sense to me that that kind of infrastructure, where all you're doing is adding costs to an existing energy source, will compete with what we have invested in, which is technology-based energy sources. If the finish line means getting to 100% clean energy use in Canada, it may not be quite as far away as it seems. 60% of Canada's power already comes from hydroelectricity, which is renewable, which leaves burning fuel to heat buildings and emissions from vehicles as the big offenders. Let's put a price on things that we don't want to get them out of the system and put incentives on what we do want, clean energy. That would really help to accelerate things. The province of Alberta took a step in that direction with its new tax on carbon. Emissions will be capped, but not before they're allowed to rise by 40%. Among those alongside the Premier supporting the move was Lorraine Mitchellmore from Shell. Some cities are setting targets too, like Vancouver. It's aiming to have 100% of all energy use renewable by 2050. Cities are going to look different in 2050 when, than they look today. Now, projecting out 35 years, it's hard to know exactly what it's going to be. But what we do know now is that we can build passive buildings, like this one we're in here today, that can um, produce all the energy they need for the buildings. And we're going to see much more transit and more walkable communities. Um, and we're going to see a lot more electricity being used in all of our transportation. Even if Canada does hit 100% clean energy and does it by 2050, that by itself won't be enough to stop climate change. Every other country has to bear down and make similar choices. The clean energy race isn't just a Canadian competition. It's a global race to try to stop the destabilization of our climate. Chris Brown, CBC News, Vancouver.